Good evening. Welcome to Monday, September the 14th, Committee of the Whole meeting to be held in our wonderful concert hall in Victoria Hall. I'd also like to remind everyone that the meeting is being live streamed and audio video recorded and shall form part of the record which will be retained according to the Town of Coburg Retention Bylaw. For further information about the collection, please contact Mr. Larmer, our Municipal Clerk's Office. With that, Deputy Mayor, over to you for agenda additions. Thank you, Your Worship. You gotta put your mic on. Thank you, Your Worship. There are no uh, agenda additions this evening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any disclosure of pecuniary interests of members of Council? Seeing none, we'd like to proceed. Mr. Larmer. Next, Your Worship, we have General Government Services and we have Chair Deputy Mayor Suzanne Sagan. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. The first item is a memo from the Municipal Clerk Manager of Legislative Services regarding diversity, inclusion, and equity within the Town of Coburg. The action recommended that Council receive the memo from the Municipal Clerk Manager of Legislative Services for information purposes, and further that Municipal Council on June 29, 2020, provided staff with a direction to draft and present a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy for the Town of Coburg that will encourage, promote, and insist upon awareness, um, equality, and acceptance by all residents and municipal staff in the corporation of the Town of Coburg. And further that, staff recommend that the Municipal Council not only provide direction for a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, but that Council engage and establish a leadership approach in responding to a call for more municipal action on supporting diversity, inclusion, and equity across the jurisdiction on the Town of Coburg community. And further, that Council direct staff to create supporting governance structures with internal and external stakeholders from the Black, Indigenous, and people of color, women, people with disabilities, newcomers to Canada, the lesbian, gay, bise bisexual, trans, queer, two-spirit, intersex, and asexual peoples, as well as those who identify as pansexual, questioning, non-binary, and other gender, gender and sexual minorities, 2SLGBTQ1AP+, community, and other visible minorities, in order to identify and develop priority strate strategies and initiatives to support the equity, diversity, and inclusion effort in the town of Coburg. And further, that Council directs staff to engage Coburg's diverse community to help create potential draft terms of reference to advise Council and make recommendations to provide a monitoring and measuring role to help ensure that the town applies a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to its policies, services, and programs and further that Council direct staff to make an application to join the Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities, CIM, as a commitment to investing time and resources toward creating a more welcoming and inclusive community in which the CIM network brings together municipalities that want to improve their policies against racism, discrimination, exclusion, and intolerance and together the municipalities undertake initiatives to eliminate all forms of discrimination with a view to building open and inclusive societies. And further, that Council directs staff to bring forward a report to a December Council meeting or an earlier meeting presenting a status update on the recommendations approved and outlined within the staff report. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mr. Larmer, uh, would you like to make a summary or would you like to call our staff member to the, uh, no, at this point, you're fine. Thank you. Are there any further questions, clarification at this point from members of council? Councillor Chorley. First of all, I'd like to thank our clerk, Mr. Larmer, for the initiative taken on this report. Um, I certainly agree that the Town of Coburg has the opportunity to play a leadership role in terms of ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, more engagement with some of these communities 
uh, here within our, our own community. My question to Mr. Larmer is, can you just explain in more detail some of the engagement methods that you're envisioning regarding um, these different groups and communities? Mr. Larmer? Um, through you, Your Worship, to member council and council members. Um, in regards to this report, I think, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll read through the analysis, I think one of the important steps um, in this process is to engage the community. It's gonna be one of the larger um, pieces in regards to this. Um, I myself, as reference the report, um, do not have the direct you know, experiences uh, in regarding equity, inclusion, and diversity um, other than what I can read and understand and, and listen. And I think that last word is the key and, and listening is something that has to be brought to the forefront. Um, not just listening internally, sorry, externally, but also internally as well, as well across different um, organizations within the community as well. Um, so an ad hoc committee um, of council is something that we can and work to to create a terms of reference um, but for me and staff to develop a terms of reference on our own I don't think it does the justice um, that it needs in order to really understand of what this committee um, wants to see in the lens that have learned and actually lived experiences in order to develop a concept and education and communication with the public um, one of the things that is a, is a big communication piece would be our social media, um, bang the table is one, um, surveys of another strategies that we can work with our communication department um, to try to get an understanding of what direction the community would like to go to and try to find those discussions currently that we're maybe not hearing in the community um, within the town of Coburg and uh, bring those to the forefront to make sure that we're you know, including a lot of those um, experiences, understanding, and um, innovative and, and a way forward. Um, one of the things I also mentioned in the report is that um, uh, some of these diverse and, 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 and minorities and groups that would be um, someone that would need to um, you know, want to be part of this program might not feel comfortable um, coming to a meeting or, or, or being recognized themselves, which is something that um, we still want to hear and engage from those individuals. Um, so we need to create some kind of shared experience or an area where we can listen without making somebody uncomfortable and still being able to come forward and provide their experiences. Um, some programs and other local municipalities that are part of the CIM group have what's called a door program, which they have um, across the town. They have these doors that are set up around town and they allow people to write on them, um, on both sides of them, which their experiences, you know, related to any discrimination, racism, um, anything along the lines that would be included in, in a program or plan or strategy going forward. And it gives them a, a, an ability to have their voice heard without um, coming forward if they're, they're not ready yet, um, which the door represents that opening um, for them to be able to pass that line and be comfortable with sharing their experiences and providing that um, individual learning experience to the town so we can move forward um, within the town itself. Um, and that goes um, as well with our, um, our own organization too, um, to make sure that we are you know, considering everyone, all those experiences as well and, and going to the forefront to get that listening. Um, so that's a key part of this, um, obviously, um, I'm not an expert in it. We'd have to engage our communications department as well as we'd have to engage that um, local group within the going forward and, and try to uh, learn from them as well. Councillor Chorley, does that suffice at this point? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Larmer, I know that you've introduced our new member uh, to council. Would you or Mr. Davy like to at least for camera to introduce our newest member to the team uh, for those at home? Yeah, so um, I can quickly introduce the town of Coburg as part of the um, previous budget awarded a contract for an accessibility coordinator, which is uh, Jamie Kramer. Um, we have a unique ex uh, opportunity here because Jamie Kramer um, left her previous uh, position at the Canadian for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, the center, I think that's right, Jamie, I have to get that right, sorry. Um, the, the Center for Canadian Diversity and Inclusion. 
um, as well as she came from uh, Miss Palatine City of Windsor prior to that, which was the accessibility co coordinator, um, as well as created the inclusiveness plan, um, a diversity for that that municipality as well. Um, so before council passed that resolution, we um, interviewed Jamie, and she's successful for the position of accessibility, which um, she believes is uh, is also part of this solely as well that accessibility component for this. So we know that we have a fair bit of work to do with our accessibility um, program in the town um, with our multi accessibility plan. So um, we really think that this can incorporate um, nicely into that position, and um, this position actually um, and this. This, this this policy going forward as part of this report, definitely we have a very um, knowledgeable, experienced person now on Coburg staff that would be able to help um, develop this and, and utilize this program. Um, part of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion is working with municipalities to create similar programs like this. Jamie, if I'm misstepping, you can remind me. But also working with large companies, too, to make sure that there are, are meetings and the references related to this. Um, as well, so um, that's Jamie Kramer, and, and that is a, a, a contract right now. Um, and going forward, we'll have to see if, depending on what the direction is, because if this moves forward, there is a little work on council's end and staff's end to get this program going. Um, and I think it's important. And the recommendation is a bit long, but it's basically in six parts. Um, and then the last part is to bring a report back to council. Um, so this program, we'd have to. Um, depending on what council's direction is. We would definitely bring back a report in December too, just to give the council some timelines and understanding of what the next steps are. And if I can add to the members and council and the public, uh, for the first time in many years, we have new microphones. Uh, we are all adjusting. We're realizing now we don't have to be onto the mic to speak. Actually, the further back we are, actually the clearer it is. So please bear with us as we adjust to the new microphones and we hope that you like the new sound going forward. And it's something that council put in the previous budget. With that being said, are there any other questions, comments from members of council? Seeing none, all those in favor? Against? Carried. Mr. Larmer? Next, Your Worship, we have Planning and Development Services, and we have Chair Councillor Nicole Beattie. Thank you. Hello? Great. Thanks. Just a, a quick question through you, Your Worship, to the clerk. I noticed that we have a few presentations that I believe from some of the applicants as well as the Director of Planning. Uh, just for a point of order, do I call the presenter up prior to reading the motion, or do I read the motion for that to be on the floor and then welcome the presenter? Yeah, so um, you would definitely just read the motion, put it on the floor, and then open for discussion, and then um, pass it to the director, and then we can go from there. That's wonderful. Comfortable. Thank you very much. Item number one is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding an application for site plan approval for the Canadian Coast Guard Search and Rescue Station, the redevelopment of the Watson McEwen Taramura Architects on behalf of the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans for 114 Division Street in Coburg. And the action recommended is that council receive the memo from the Director of Planning and Development for information purposes. And further, that council authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and presented to council for adoption at a regular council meeting to authorize the mayor and the municipal clerk to execute a development agreement with Her Majesty the Queen in right of Canada represented by the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans for the proposed redevelopment of the Canadian Coast Guard Search and Rescue Station at 114 Division Street in Coburg, subject to the finalization of details by municipal staff and partner review agencies. And further, that Council authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and presented to Council for adoption at a regular Council meeting to remove the holding H symbol from the subject development lands. Are there any questions or comments from members of Council? Seeing none, over to Director McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, tonight, uh, you, you see my report on the agenda regarding the, uh, the application for site plan control for uh, the uh, Coast Guard's uh, search and rescue station redevelopment. Um, 
I do have a uh, brief PowerPoint presentation uh, for the benefit of Council just to go over some of the key points uh, of the proposal. Um, Mr. Alden Jansen, uh, an engineer from uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, or DFO, uh, wasn't able to be here this evening. He's actually based out of Winnipeg and has travel restrictions currently. Um, however, um, Lisa Young is uh, here from DFO, uh, southwestern Ontario, I believe, <laughs> a little closer. So she was able to make uh, this evening's uh, meeting of council. Um, so uh, as you uh, may be aware, the uh, existing uh, Coast Guard uh, search and rescue station is um, uh, aging. It's, it's been around for a number of, uh, of decades at its current location and in fact is um, uh, not uh, meeting their needs in terms of operations and as well uh, part of the complex is uninhabitable due to some health and safety issues with, um, with the structure. Oh, there we go. It's going. <laughs> All right. Um, so the, locationally, um, as you're aware, the, uh, the Coast Guard is located on the uh, uh, north end of the East Pier uh, within the lawn area. And there are actually uh, two parcels uh, involved in this uh, site. Uh, the concrete T pier to the uh, west of the, uh, of the main pier and the Coast Guard station is where the, the boats uh, are, are housed. And as well, a 1,573 square meter uh, area on the east side of the pier which is essentially the lawn area uh, between the, uh, the concrete, or sorry, the asphalt laneway and the, uh, the beach. Uh, this uh, asphalt laneway is, uh, in fact, uh, splits the two parcels that are leased by the, uh, the federal government. So on to the lease. Uh, of course, the federal government used to own uh, the, the pier and the harbor until they divested it to the municipality a number of years ago. Um, there is a uh, lease uh, with the federal government uh, pertaining to the Coast Guard. It is a, a perpetual lease which uh, provides the federal government free and exclusive use of access occupation of the lands, buildings and structures that are located on those two parcels uh, of land that I mentioned. Uh, the lessee or the federal government shall still abide by all of the rules and regulations of the municipality um, and, and shall not construct any buildings on the property uh, without council's approval. Um, and that's being the, the lessor, we are the lessor of the lands, and the approval of uh, this, um, of new buildings and structures and such shall not be unreasonably withheld. <clears throat> and finally, uh, the federal government is responsible for the maintenance responsibility of ownership and all liabilities associated with the use, operation, and function of the uh, Coast Guard search and rescue uh, station. In terms of uh, the application, it was just over a year ago that uh, the Coast Guard submitted the site plan application. Uh, it was received by council, this council on August the uh, 12th, 2019. Uh, since then, it's been undergoing uh, extensive technical review through the uh, development review team. Um, and um, the final uh, drawings have just uh, fairly recently been uh, signed off by, uh, by these, this team. Uh, current policy context is that the lands are designated uh, in a dual designation, both environmental constraint area as well as the public open space uh, east pier area in the harbour area secondary plan. Uh, zoning is very similar, uh, environmental constraint uh, zone which of course rec recognizes the uh, Lake Ontario shoreline and wave uh, uprush hazard and as well open space exception to holding um, uh, exception one zone, fairly uh, detailed zone that covers all of the East Pier uh, from essentially the municipal parking lot down to the, um, the lighthouse. Um, so currently the, uh, the site is occupied by one story uh, search and rescue station and workshop uh, for the Canadian Coast Guard. Um, I mentioned earlier the buildings are deemed unsuitable and uh, in fact unsafe for uh, occupation and use for, for long term. So the Coast Guard uh, is proposing to uh, demolish and remove the existing buildings on the site, including that detached uh, dwelling, portable office, uh, the detached garage, and uh, any accessory uh, buildings. In, in their place will be a new uh, 486 square meter uh, uh, Coast Guard station uh, containing a two-story residential module and a one-story uh, garage and workshop uh, to the north. 
These uh, two uh, modules are actually linked by a center uh, single-story breezeway uh, that accommodates uh, office and ancillary functions. Um, the, the landscape uh, scheme for the site uh, was intended to respect the environmental uh, sensitivity of the area given it is um, uh, next to a, um, an evolving um, beach area as well as an active uh, working recreational harbour. Uh, their plan was to try to preserve and enhance existing natural uh, heritage resources that are on the site and um, four of those large mature birch trees uh, a mature uh, willow tree and three smaller birch trees along the, uh, the east side of the, the lawn area are proposed to be re retained and protected. They will also help provide uh, shade through the summer uh, months as well and screening from the public uh, realm. In addition, just on the uh, west side or the laneway side of the buildings, there will be softscape uh, ground-oriented landscaping uh, to, uh, in terms of in the form of gardens and such. Um, as indicated with respect to the building, uh, they're conceived as two modules being the uh, two different functions, one being the um, Coast Guard um, residential module to the south, as well as the single story uh, garage workshop uh, to the north. Uh, the single story breezeway, as I indicated, is in the center. And the building is, is not a, a public facility in terms of um, the general public or residents. It is an active uh, working uh, station and uh, no interaction with the public occurs. In terms of uh, building and uh, sustainable and landscape uh, design, because it is a federal government project, uh, they are required to meet the, uh, the National Building Code, which uh, supersedes the, uh, the Ontario Building Code. I've included a number of renderings uh, that uh, the Coast Guard provided of different view planes uh, for, for the building both from uh, the harbour uh, and the north as well as the beach views. So the building design uh, specifically is intended to address the federal government's uh, initiatives uh, that all new buildings shall be net zero carbon neutral ready. Accordingly, the building design is following a passive house, a passive house uh, high performance design approach to, uh, to new buildings for the residential wing and the, the connecting breezeway. The passive, ho passive house design uh, is uh, a design that consumes 80% less uh, energy than a conventional building and will also rely on um, sun shading, exterior roller blinds and high insulation levels to uh, remain cool throughout the summer months. Uh, because the, uh, the garage itself is more of an open workshop, it will remain um, more or less open to kind of the elements. Uh, for extended periods of time, and therefore more conventional building approaches are uh, proposed for, uh, for this uh, module. Um, as you can see with this rendering, a uh, view plane from looking from the beach uh, uh, westward. So the design rationale, the architect's uh, design statement for uh, the rescue station was it, for it to become a focal point uh, for the waterfront and um, enhancing the appeal of the area and as I say, respecting the environmentally, environmental sensitivity of the area. They also wanted to ensure that it still respects the um, professional uh, image of the uh, Coast Guard and their, uh, their functions. Uh, this being a very highly visible location and prominent in the community, uh, the building is intended to offer uh, you know, high quality signature design and uh, harmonize with the character of uh, of a recreational waterfront and beach area. Um, as you can see by the uh, designs, the roof line and the, the architectural uh, elements are quite uh, unique. Uh, the architectural design statement uh, specified that the roof line is uh, treated as a sculptural form or element with triangular f forms to resemble uh, abstracted sails being uh, a nautical theme. It will be easily identifiable um, and uh, certainly from, from a distance. It will act as a marker for boaters and a visual boundary between the recreational harbor area and the uh, beach, uh, Victoria Beach. Um, cladding of the materials and all of uh, all the modules will be light uh, color cement board, uh, shiplap panels, 
They are installed as a vented rain screen. Uh, sloped metal roofs, overhangs, drainage system will be provided throughout and a, a robust structural steel armature uh, for the rain gutters to provide low maintenance uh, durable solutions. The, uh, as indicated, the south, or sorry, the north um, garage workshop building will be more of a conventional design. Uh, it will have steel frame construction. Uh, there will be translucent and clear glazing above the, um, uh, above the uh, first story, I guess you could say, or the mezzanine to provide some uh, light and glow into the, uh, into the uh, structure. Um, the garage door itself will be translucent, will be uh, up, upward folding pre-manufactured hangar door to provide flexibility and storage for uh, some of their equipment, including their Zodiac uh, boats and other, and other boats that they may require. As part of the review of the application, um, it went through a comprehensive process through the development review team and external agencies, and a number of um, background detailed reports were submitted as part of the application, and those are noted uh, in the report, uh, Madam Chair. In terms of um, the East Pier and the connectivity, from day one, and in fact, even in, in pre-consultations with the um, DFO, there was a lot of communication back and forth res with respect to the future uh, East Pier uh, reconstruction and design project. And the, uh, the Coast Guard, in discussions with Director Huswick, uh, were very cogniz cognizant of the municipality's need and wants, and wanted to ensure that uh, they could accommodate or facilitate the town's uh, need for, for a pedestrian connection from the pier to the, uh, to the beach promenade, while also respecting the fact that they are an active functioning search and rescue station that does require a certain um, uh, area and functioning uh, for, their, for their actual site. In addition, um, there are some mature uh, trees, as I indicated, along the east side of the property, so there's somewhat limited area that could be actually utilized uh, for any particular um, a pedestrian link along there. So what uh, DFO has proposed is to remove and replace the existing chain link and wood, fen wood rail fencing along the east side and south side of the, uh, of the property, which is abutting the beach wall, and um, replace it with a black decorative metal fence uh, to secure the perimeter of the uh, Coast Guard, while also providing a setback of approximately three meters uh, between the uh, beach wall and this new fence to allow for pedestrian connectivity should council wish to, um, to Im implement that in the shorter to mid to long term. Um, and there certainly would not preclude any future larger pedestrian connections or design options for the south and east of the, uh, the Coast Guard station. So they, they certainly wanted to be respectful of, of that wish of the municipality and um, the actual uh, implementation uh, of the fencing and, and the pathway is something that Mr. Hustwick and uh, our parks staff will work with the DFO staff uh, in the field when that uh, time comes in next, next year. As far as public uh, notification engagement, um, as you recall back in August, um, a uh, planning staff report was brought to council to receive the uh, site plan application. And the application particulars were uh, posted on the Municipal Planning Applications webpage. And um, DFO in February, just prior to the COVID um, shutdown in March, uh, they convened their own public open house uh, regarding the uh, search and rescue station on February 13th of 2020. Approximately uh, 20 uh, persons were in attendance and asked a number of questions of uh, the consulting team and architects. I believe the mayor uh, was, president, was present and um, uh, the manager of planning was uh, also available. Some of the questions generally included um, you know, quer queries regarding the shape, the design, and the appearance of the building. Um, the response was that it was intended to be a more nautical-themed um, building to respect uh, the context of the waterfront and the harbor, um, and take the appearance of a graceful bird and a visual marker uh, for the, uh, the harbor. Some questions related to whether it was heritage enough or met the criteria for a heritage uh, harbor. Um, I guess the first uh, response in that respect is that it is not a designated uh, structure under uh, provincial legislation or property. However, under Parks Canada guidelines, it's uh, very clear that um, 
new construction shall be distinguished from historic or older construction um, and not try to create fake heritage. So, um, you know, if many of you have seen the ROM, Royal Ontario Museum, you'll see the older section of the museum and you'll see a very modern uh, front section uh, on Bloor, uh, which is intended to be distinguished from the, the old and historic. historic. Um, I should also note with respect to design, the initial design for the DFO search and rescue station prior to their submission was one of their more stock examples from an industrial harbor in southwestern Ontario, which was essentially a two-story gray box. Um, so we certainly wanted to um, work with the, the uh, Coast Guard and the uh, DFO to present something that is really quite unique, um, was very um, cutting edge in terms of sustainability and as, as well a very visible marker for, for the harbor and uh, for, for the town. So that, um, that was the, the design philosophy that the, architect, uh, the architectural team brought to the table on this, uh, which will be a one-of-a-kind search and rescue station for uh, the Canadian Coast Guard. <clears throat> and uh, Madam Chair, as you have read out on the uh, action recommended, um, I'm certainly here to answer any questions, and as well, Lisa Young from DFO may uh, also be on hand to answer any uh, maybe more specific technical questions. Thank you, Director McLaughlin. As always, it adds a um, great additional insight uh, to the application. Before returning back to the motion on the floor, are there any uh, follow-up questions or points of clarification from members of council? Your Worship? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. The only question I have, and it's been asked by a number of citizens, uh, they were curious, is there a target date for demolition? They realize the structure needs to be demolished. They're just curious as to, was the timeline yet uh, defined? So that's what I mostly received from the citizens at this point. Yes, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to the Mayor, and possibly Lisa can elaborate a little bit on uh, on the answer to this, but um, the information I received last week from uh, DFO is that they have about two more months of tender and uh, process for awarding of the tender before construction begins. Um, so, you know, assume possibly November territory, December, uh, and following which there would be about six months um, construction period. So my understanding is that they wish to uh, proceed over the winter and try to get the majority of the um, operation uh, functional by next boating season or season um, of 2021. Of course, uh, winter construction can be unpredictable depending on the harshness and severity of, of a winter that we may have. That could delay the project by a couple of months longer than, uh, than that. So optimistically, it could be April, May, um, possibly into early summer before it uh, finishes. But if if, uh, Lisa, if I've said anything incorrect, please let me know. <laughs> Is that generally? Okay, thank you. Thank you to your both. Your Worship, does that satisfy your question? Thank you. Councillor Chorley? Thank you, Director McGlashan, for that summary. Um, just following on from the Mayor's question regarding the timeline for demolition and construction, could you just briefly explain how the construction of the new Coast Guard building will intersect with the development of the East Pier. And also I noticed on the landscape design, there is a temporary operations trailer. I'm just interested in what the final location of that trailer might be. Yes, uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, Councillor Chorley. Um, yes, the, uh, the timing of um, the search and rescue station should be, uh, again, dependent on the weather, um, much uh, be completed probably in advance of the town starting the, uh, the construction on the, uh, the East Pier design. I may just ask Mr. Huswick to clarify and elaborate on some of those aspects because he is a little more in tune with that timeline. Um, but with respect to the um, location of the temporary operations trailer, um, you are correct, and unfortunately I don't have a laser, but on the left side of that slide um, you can see a rectangular box, which is um, a long box there on the left. The intended location for the operations trailer would be along the west um, side of the, um, 
the pier access laneway close to the wall uh, of the pier, directly west of the existing search and rescue station. And uh, Mr. Huswick had a number of discussions with DFO regarding that location based on the shore plan uh, draft report results for um, the engineering uh, technical uh, excuse me, assessment, thank you, <laughs> Dean, the assessment on the, uh, the harbor wall and the pier. And um, perhaps maybe I'll just ask Mr. Huswick to respond. I'm, it's kind of a little outside of my area. Madam Chair, um, just in terms of the timeline then, the uh, East Pier design, final design and costing is expected by February of next year. Following that would be the uh, preparation of tender documents. Following that would be the actual tender process. And that's assuming that council approves the capital expenditures for a construction phase uh, within the 2021 capital budget. So if that is incorporated, then of course we would proceed then based on the parameters that council um, stipulates in the budget. Uh, we would proceed to procurement and uh, I would expect that construction probably wouldn't be able to begin until late summer next year. And then we would have to, through work with the engineers, um, look at the, the, um, the structuring of the construction process. So it's quite possible, um, and depending on what council approves in the capital budget. So there's two components. There's the infrastructure repairs to the East Pier, and then there are all of the enhancements. So it's quite possible that part of the construction project would be done in the fall of 21, and then the remainder could potentially be pushed into 2022 based on weather. Um, considerations, but those are all the details that uh, are yet to be determined. So, um, assuming everything goes well with this project, uh, as the director mentioned, um, they expect and hope to have it completed by the spring of next year, which would be long before we're likely to, to get close to any type of construction. Thank you to both directors. Councillor Charlie, any follow up? or? Is that Thank you. I do have one quick follow-up question, just a minor point. Um, I think I heard this question at the open house that was in February. I didn't see in the renderings any signage or a Canadian flag. I'm just wondering if that will be included with the new building. Through you, Madam Chair. Great question, um, Councillor Chorley. Maybe uh, I'll ask uh, Lisa to respond to that. I, I understand that most federal uh, government buildings do have Canadian flags and they likely will have signage but maybe she can elaborate thank you hi yes I can confirm that uh, as a federal workplace it will have both the Canadian flag and our standard signage thank you thank you to both any further questions Councillor Darling thank you madam chair um, just in the notes here, it says may, this question may go to uh, the interim CAO. It says that uh, they will uh, um, look after all liabilities associated with the property. I'm just curious, are one of those liabilities paying taxes or do they pay a stipend or does the federal government get use of that land for free? Uh, yes, through you, uh, Chair, to the Councillor, no, there's no uh, compensation for the use of that. That was part of the uh, divestiture agreement. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other further questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> through you, Madam Chair, to Mr. McGlashan, or uh, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the sustainability aspects of the building. It's a very unique style. And what kind of passive heating, what kind of, um, like, is there solar, is there thermal energy, what kind of uh, um, sustainability aspects are there to this uh, building? It's fairly small, but it certainly has a southern exposure, so if you could elaborate on that. Thank you. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the passive house um, philosophy is one of the most um, the highest performance building uh, standard uh, that you can really achieve, and particularly in residential, but they are being applied to um, non-residential applications as well. 
Um, it is a voluntary standard that uh, exceeds the um, uh, all building codes uh, throughout um, throughout Canada, at least in other, in other jurisdictions. Um, so in terms of the actual uh, design or, or structure, I may ask Lisa, I'm not sure if you know a little bit more of the ins and outs, but um, Passive House uh, is a, certainly a very high recognized um, uh, design philosophy and utilizes only 20% of the energy normal conventional homes uh, and bu buildings would potentially, um, um, maybe Lisa can uh, answer that question a little better, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so I can elaborate. The passive house system is a, a method of design that uses extreme insulation values to limit the amount of energy that's used and then it uses a combination of passive solar to gain thermal heat and then also um, uh, full air exchange. So it's, co it's combining a few different systems in order to drastically reduce the amount of energy that's required to run the station. Thank you. And ma and Madam Chair, if I may just elaborate, um, I would, had the uh, benefit, pleasure of taking a tour of a passive house design in Ottawa through one of the FCM conferences a couple of years ago, and I can attest to the fact that the insulation levels are, are extremely large. In fact, most of the windows in a passive house design are, are recessed because the, w the walls are actually quite thick and full of insulation, and that they are so efficient that they, um, they actually have to have uh, appropriate uh, air vent ventilation and uh, circulation systems to be able to move the air around because it is actually so efficient it's almost airtight <laughs> in that sense but they are uh, the highest standard of, um, of building construction in terms of sustainability really you can find um, in uh, at least in in Canada and and in uh, Europe thank you very m thank you very much your worship um, again, I this time don't have a question, but I would very much like to thank the minister, all the efforts from the Canadian Coast Guard's search and rescue station, and all the members. The reason I say that because you've had a very proud tradition in the town of Coburg. It would be so easy for you to often relocate to another location, and I'm very delighted that you've been creative and innovative to bring this to stay within the town of Coburg. And more importantly, the part I want to emphasize is that you are an active station. And I know there are times, unfortunately, we've had a call on your service for different types of rescue, both within Coburg, Port Hope, and along the shore of, and I should say, the waterways of Lake Ontario. So I'm extremely proud that you're going to be here, I hope, for another 100 plus years. So thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you, everyone, and it's certainly our privilege to serve this community, and we, we look forward to continuing the relationship for many years into the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, and as coordinator of planning, I would just like to echo His Worship's comments on not only being an active tenant and uh, community partner in the town of Coburg, but most definitely I think this passive house and an architectural design um, not as only going to modernize but while maintaining the heritage character of our of our pier but will be most complementary to the future um, revitalization of the East Pier. So thank you to all involved in the presentations and additional information this evening. Um, I think we've had a good discussion and answered some detailed questions so uh, just final call for any follow-up comments. Uh, seeing none, unless uh, members of council would like me to reread the motion um, as printed on the agenda or shown on the agenda, uh, the motion on the floor. So I will call a vote. Uh, all those in favor? Seeing none or opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Thank you. Moving along to item number two is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding an application site plan approval for the Golden Plat. My apologies. Golden Plow Lodge at 555 Courthouse Road and 983 Burnham Street, Coburg. 
The action recommended is that council receive the memo from the Director of Planning and Development for information purposes, and further that council authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and presented to council for adoption at a regular council meeting to authorize the mayor and the municipal clerk to execute a development agreement with the Corporation of the County of Northumberland and Lakefront Utility Services, Inc., for the proposed redevelopment of the Golden Plough Lodge at 555 Courthouse Road and 983 Burnham Street, Coburg, subject to the finalization of details by municipal staff and partner review agencies. And further, that Council authorized the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and presented to Council for adoption at a regular Council meeting to remove the holding age symbol from the subject development lands. Before I turn it over to the presentation, are there any preliminary questions from members of council? Seeing none, over to the director of planning for the presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and attached to your agenda is uh, my staff report regarding the, uh, the Golden Plow Lodge redevelopment project. And as has been the case over the course of this project, uh, the county has provided uh, this council with um, updates of the project as uh, it has progressed and tonight is no different. Uh, they wish to provide you with a, um, an overview summary presentation of uh, the results of the technical review and um, leading up to the uh, construction of the new Golden Plow Lodge. So this evening uh, we have a, a number of people from the county, actually I'll introduce um, them to you. Uh, Jerry Pilon and Ryan Stitt from Salter Pilon Architecture will be making the presentation. Uh, Jennifer Moore, the uh, Chief Administrative Officer for the County, as well as Mo Panu, the uh, Director of Transportation Waste Management, uh, and um, Mark McIntosh, who is also the Project uh, Construction Manager as well from uh, the County, are here this evening to answer any technical detailed questions about the, the project. Um, so maybe I will ask um, Mr. Uh, Pilon if he would like to uh, come up to the uh, dais and make his presentation. Thank you and welcome to Council Chambers. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Director McGlashan and the rest of the members of Council. We're uh, thrilled to be here tonight to give you an update as to where we are and our status with the project development um, and present to you the update for Golden Plow Lodge and the Northumberland and County Archives and Museum project. Um, as has been said that we've attempted to try and um, give updates regularly as the project has progressed. So we'll try and give you a high level briefing as to what we have done and where we're at today and uh, what we're looking for going forward. So our outline basically will be to give you a bit of a project background. We'll go through the project location and site plan. I know most of you are familiar with the project, but we'll keep it at a high level. We have a few renderings that we wanna show you um, just as, as the project has progressed. We'll give you an update on our project cost estimate and schedule a status update on our consultations with our neighbors and Courthouse Road, and then we'll talk about approvals and next steps, and then you know share with you contact information should there be any questions going forward beyond that. Um, by way of project background, um, the existing facility is 151 beds, approximately 100,000 square feet. Um, as you all know, there are, the existing facility is somewhat aged and has a number of different additions and, and various parts to it. The new facility that's envisioned is one that's 180 new beds, um, so representing an, an increase in the number of beds to serve the county, um, and it'll be just over 200,000 square feet. The facility also includes the development of the Northumberland County Archives and Museum project, which is about 6,000 square feet. This project will be pursuing lead silver, and uh, before we get asked the question on Passive House, um, the, uh, there isn't a long-term care Passive House project in Canada. Um, and Passive House, while it has requirements of energy efficiencies through thermal density and wall systems and other things, those things also limit the number, amount of glazing you can have in a wall. Um, and long-term care facilities, by virtue of the guidelines we build to the province, dictate that uh, our, the residents like to have lots of natural light and large windows. Those two contradict each other, and our priority goal is to comply with the Ministry of Long-Term Care and meet their requirements. So Ryan will speak briefly uh, about our sustainability objectives and how we're achieving them within that project, but I thought I'd save that question. Um, the project was initiated in 2016 uh, with a pre-design and conceptual uh, project endorsed by the County Council in 2017. 
Our firm was engaged in April of 2018, um, and we've developed with the county a, a three-phase uh, approach to the project. Phase one will be the construction of the new GPL and the Archives and Museum project. Once the project is constructed, the residents in the existing Golden Plow Lodge will be decanted and moved into the new facility, which will allow us to move to phase two, which is the demolition of the existing GPL. Once the demolition is completed, phase three will be the site remediation and the, the finalization of all the campus site works and turning the rest of the, the site itself into a, a larger campus for the county. In terms of approvals and next steps, um, uh, the approval process we have to go through involves a number of different uh, bodies that, that need to endorse the project going forward. Uh, primarily, the Ministry of uh, Long-Term Care is one. Um, we're happy to report that approvals have been obtained uh, from the technical group and the minister to move forward with construction. And it was a happy day on August 19th, uh, a while ago, just uh, under a month ago, where, where that approval was granted. So the project has been tendered for construction, um, and it was tendered on September 2nd to a pre-qualified group of, of general contractors and pre-qualified subs. Um, obviously, we are working and have been working with the town of Coburg through the site plan approval process, as well as the building permit process and a foundation permit. Um, and we're, I would say, virtually through that process with a couple minor comments outstanding that we feel are, are something that is uh, uh, easily uh, dealt with in, in short order here, hopefully. So our next steps will be to complete the tendering process. Um, and right now we're in the middle of a four week planned tender period. Uh, construction is set to begin this fall. And we will continue to work with the neighbors um, and have development support agreements signed by them. And uh, we'll continue to communicate with the public uh, via a project website that the county has established and will be uh, operational for the duration of the project. And then obviously be available uh, as a consulting team and with the county to address any concerns that arise during construction uh, should any actually arise. In terms of the site plan process, um, just to give you a high level view of, of where we're at, it's been a, a, a thorough and rigorous, rigorous process. Um, our initial site plan submission was August 13th of 2019. We made a resubmission uh, on November 13th uh, of that year after a preliminary consultation or, and comments were received back from the Technical Review Committee. Uh, we made submission two on March 13th of 2020. We made an update once again on June 5th. And then uh, our last resubmission was on July 23rd of this year. Uh, we received our final comments uh, on August 13th. And all comments related to the construction of the new build have been addressed. There's some minor comments related to Courthouse Road and easements which will be addressed upon the upload of Courthouse Road by the county which is hopefully anticipated to be September, October County Council. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to my associate, Ryan Stitt, who will walk you through a bit of an overview on the, on the project location itself, our site plan as it's been developed, and walk you through a few of the renderings and some of the sustainability issues and, and approaches that we've been taking. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good evening, Council, Madam Chair, and Director McGlashan. So just to take a look at the, uh, the site as it is right now, uh, I did bring a pointer just to help here, so excuse me if I turn my back for a second. Uh, so looking at the, the property itself, um, we can see the existing golden plow. Uh, directly below the existing golden plow is the recently constructed uh, county headquarters at 555 Courthouse Road. And the new Golden Plow will be constructed in the greenfield to the west of both of those properties. And in the middle of the site is the existing Halcyon Place, which stays uh, as is during construction. Uh, so on this slide, we also see uh, in blue the existing uh, outline of Courthouse Road as it is today. So for the new uh, site plan that's being proposed, um, in that greenfield site on the west side of the property, uh, we are showing our, our uh, three-story Golden Plow Lodge redevelopment. As mentioned, Halcyon Place still centered in the middle of the property there. Uh, the 555 Courthouse Road uh, County Headquarters being in the southeast corner of the property. 
and with the demolition of the existing Golden Plow, uh, leaving a greenfield site on the east side of the property there. Um, in this development, there's also a realignment of Courthouse Road uh, that brings from the existing entrance off of Elgin Street through the center of the site, uh, giving access uh, 255, or sorry, maintaining access 2555, and also um, providing a new entry point into Halcyon Place and a new entry point into the uh, new Golden Plow. Um, there's a few parking lots located in this vicinity as well for the development, uh, parking lot to the south of the property for visitors and parking lots to the north of the property uh, for, for visitors, or sorry, for uh, staff and facilities at the top side of the, of the site. Um, the realignment also uh, establishes a turning circle at the top for access uh, of vehicles uh, into the uh, north end of the site that would be used for uh, deliveries as well. So it's been a long conversation with the design and sustainability of this project. Uh, as Jerry mentioned, uh, we are pursuing a lead silver uh, designation for the project. Um, and this is being done through our team with our sustainability consultant as well. Uh, so this conversation has gone through all the regular channels with the county uh, and the consultant team to be able to develop the targets that we are looking to initiate within the design of the project itself. Uh, so a few notable ones at the bottom of this slide uh, are showing natural light to the resident rooms and common spaces um, to meet the sustainability efforts, but also to provide the requirements of the, the Ministry of Health, um, energy efficient mechanical systems, uh, LED lighting throughout with occupancy sensors where available, um, the construction materials uh, with um, high organic composition, also locally sourced materials as well, uh, green roofs, both active uh, for the residents and the staff, uh, and non-active uh, roofs as well where it wasn't uh, viable to access them. And access to fresh air into the resident rooms as per ministry guidelines, um, access to outdoor courtyards and terraces to engage with the environment, and also bird-friendly glazing to protect uh, the facility from uh, birds in the area. So a few images of the facility um, that I believe the town of Coburg is familiar with at this time, but this is a, a dusk rendering of the front entrance of the Golden Plow Lodge uh, redevelopment proposal. Um, in this development, uh, there's a large wood canopy at the front of the building, um, a center atrium uh, that is the glazed piece. to offer a beacon to the front door of the facility. Uh, on the left-hand side of this uh, image is the museum um, and archives component of the project as well. So it is a separate piece of this building but is integrated into the design so it does have the ability to flow into the facility as well. Uh, speaking about natural materials, um, as mentioned, the, the wood canopy, but also natural stone elements uh, to relate to the uh, existing context of the county as well, and also to um, mimic and respond to some of the architecture of the existing 555 headquarters facility. Uh, this image is another angle of that front entrance looking underneath the canopy and up the east side of the building. Um, as a daytime image, uh, you can see that the, uh, there is a few... Um, Green space is located on the east side of the facility, along with uh, roof terraces as well that you can see just behind uh, the main stairwell for the facility. And again, bringing that natural element into the interior of the building as well, uh, looking at natural courtyards for the residents to be able to engage in um, that are included within the design of this facility. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so what we'd like to do now is just give you a bit of an update as to where we are with the cost estimate and our schedule for the project. Um, the, the graphic you see there is one that we've been tracking from the beginning. Um, the project cost is approximately $80 million, uh, uh, con hard construction cost, $100 million with soft costs involved. So it's a very significant project for the county, as you can see. Um, as mentioned, we had ministry approval to go to tender August 19th, uh, a very happy day. Uh, so we issued documents for construction on September 2nd um, to be closed uh, approximately four weeks from that date. Uh, so we do anticipate a fall construction start for the project. Um, and as you can see from the graphic, uh, you know, design started 
early in 2018. Um, we're now in, in 2020 and tendered. Uh, by fall, we will be under construction. And with the different phases that we alluded to previously, we have a target date for resident move-in for the summer of 2022. And that's an important date for us because um, you know, the, the funding from the ministry for the project uh, has to have an occupancy date attached to it. And so um, the county has been very proactive in trying to move this project forward and get the residents into the new facility as soon as possible and ahead of that schedule. So it's a very exciting time for us to, to get, be able to get, get shovels in the ground and get moving on the project. Too fast for the plan. Um, in terms of consultation with our neighbors, um, uh, communication with the neighbors began really at the pre-design stage. The county undertook that uh, themselves early in 2016, and it's been ongoing through the design process and will remain that way through construction. Uh, the primary consultations in the, with the neighbors and the primary neighbors are the Church on the Hill, Halcyon Place, uh, the retail building at 1000 Elgin Street West, and the residence on Elgin Street, 9, 978 Elgin Street West. Um, in, in terms of the consultations, uh, a number of meetings were held uh, with those groups to, to keep them informed and bring them up to date and let them know what we're planning and doing. Um, for the Church on the Hill, the access will be via Courthouse Road, the west leg to Elgin Street, as, as was uh, shown on that site plan previously. Uh, the county obtained a verbal agreement on a discussion, all discussion items during a meeting that was held on August 19th with the Church on the Hill. And as luck would have it, the church is having their board meeting tonight at the same time uh, where they're going to ratify that agreement um, that was, was previously um, uh, made with the county. In terms of Halcyon Place, uh, a number of consultations there. Access will be removed from Courthouse Road, the East Leg, but it will be part of the internal campus road. Um, and and they, we do have signed written consent received from the board for that. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, you know, continue to have conversations with them through construction. Uh, in terms of the business on Elgin, um, access will be provided through Courthouse Road, the West Leg, with access to Elgin Street. And the county is still in communication with that owner. In terms of the residents, uh, the main access is proposed to be from Courthouse Road, once again, the East Leg, and the county is still in communication with that owner as well. In terms of consultations with the town of Coburg on Courthouse Road, um, the county is proceeding with the upload of Courthouse Road as directed by the town of Coburg, and a bylaw will be coming to county council in September, October for the upload of Courthouse Road. Uh, and during the construction of the western and eastern legs will remain open. The east-west leg will be closed during construction early next year, uh, however, as part of it, we have a phasing plan uh, and bus service will remain accessible throughout construction, which was obviously a, a big requirement for Halcyon Place and other residents and, and staff uh, that work in the area as well. So that really is our, our kind of quick synopsis of, of our, our, what, we've, what we've done, where we started and where we're at. Um, in, in terms of contact information, um, Mr. Mark McIntosh, who is here tonight, is the project manager, and, and all communications will go through Mark. Um, there's also a general project email that is, that is on the screen and part of the package. And then there's a part project web page that will uh, continue to be updated and documented and, and show the progress of the project as we move forward. So, uh, Madam Chair, with that, that's our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that additional detail to a future project that's not only going to enable people to age in place with dignity, but to continue to invest in long-term care of, of Northumberland County residents. So thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions or detailed follow-up from members of council? Councillor Charlie? <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about the Ontario governments. Um, they've they have announced an independent commission to look into long-term care in Ontario. The last I saw was that a report is due from that commission on April 30th next year. I'm just wondering if that report and if that commission were to make recommendations that would pertain to the physical long-term care environment, would there be time or flexibility in your project? to be able to implement those kind of recommendations. Uh, thank you, through, my, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that um, what we've tried to do is be proactive on how we've approached the design of this project. And while uh, we all await what the, what the uh, ministry will come forward with for their guidelines, I can uh, say to you that the, the standard to which this home is being built through the vision and, and forethought of the county um, is one that I'm sure will meet and exceed any of those guidelines going forward. 
Um, the, the design itself has been uh, put forward and even gone to tender with the flexibility to adapt the number of private rooms versus basic rooms uh, on a dime without major reconstruction or major redesign to influence and impact the construction schedule. That was a decision that was made by the committee as we discussed opportunities with the design early on. Uh, beyond that, I think the majority of the, of the things that will come from my early discussions um, and ongoing discussions with uh, folks at the ministry are that um, the target for a lot of these things is really existing homes that don't meet uh, a high enough standard in terms of what resident needs are through lessons learned through COVID. Um, I can tell you that we have dealt with this through the use of um, materials and finishes that are uh, uh, have a high sensitivity to infection prevention and control measures that are very important in those types of environments. We have air handling systems that are superior to any other that uh, we currently have in long-term care uh, facilities in the province, um, or at least meet the highest standard, let's put it that way. Um, and that, um, you know, I, I do feel confident that the, the caliber of the facility that we've designed with the guidance of the county is one that will allow us to adapt to whatever comes forward. Thank you very much. Any other questions to the presenters? Seeing none, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, to the director, I believe we have a secondary presentation. A second. Excellent, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I certainly thank uh, the presenters for uh, providing some good background and details on, uh, on this uh, proposal. Um, my intent is to just run through some of the key highlights uh, from the municipal um, development team uh, perspective and I'll try not to um, regurgitate anything that uh, has already been said by uh, the presenters. Um, and I think everyone knows where the site is uh, at this point. I'll skip through this. I think. Oh, there we go. So uh, yes, the application was formally received by uh, this, this council on September 9th, uh, 2019, almost one year ago uh, today. Uh, the lands are located uh, within a major institutional area in the Coburg West Business Park uh, secondary plan uh, of the official plan. And similarly, the site is zoned institutional holding zone in the uh, zoning bylaw. As a part of the background review, um, the submission included a number of reports, approximately a dozen, uh, detailed reports and plans submitted with the application. Um, these included the normal architectural site plan, site servicing, grading, electrical plans, but also included mechanical vegetation management, landscape plans, tree inventories and such, as well as uh, urban design briefs and uh, topographical and ge geotechnical information. So there's an awful lot of information that was submitted uh, with the applications and I can certainly attest when, when they are submitted, um, the number of drawings is, is uh, tremendous when they come in. So we've been trying to go digital as much as possible uh, in the last uh, six months with the, uh, with the pandemic and it seems to have worked to reduce some of the paperwork. Um, so the proposal as you've seen uh, from the presenters is a, a very large um, redevelopment project for the Golden Plow. Um, I will not uh, go into too much detail as the presenters have provided it. However, one of the key elements of, of the site design is that it is to function as a, as a campus, um, as a it's sort of a long-term um, institutional campus, but not necessarily institutional, I guess that's not the right word, it'd be residential campus in this case, um, provide dignity for, for persons uh, in, in long-term care. The, uh, the site will be uh, very um, uh, supportive of active transportation with uh, bicycle lanes throughout the, uh, the major uh, driveways from Elgin Street up through to Strathy Road and to Burnham Street. Uh, and that uh, was a, certainly a major part of our official plan policies and uh, of this design philosophy is to ensure um, safe and active uh, transportation modes for, for all. In addition, throughout the site, uh, there will be dedicated um, uh, pedestrian pathways and seating areas uh, for uh, residents, visitors alike to uh, meander through the site um, take advantage of various uh, interpretive stops uh, along the way and in particular uh, there is a, an ind indigenous um, interpretive area stop. I believe there are some other um, natural heritage um, interpretive stops as well throughout this, um, throughout this site so that people can 
um, educate themselves uh, as well as um, experience a, a nice open space area. Um, within the overall context, uh, I believe um, uh, the presenters did provide you with some, uh, some background as to where the site is in relation to existing uses. Um, Halcyon Place is kind of the, uh, the center of the overall complex and will remain uh, in situ. Uh, all of the development and redevelopment and demolition will actually happen around them and they will be accommodated through new access points and actually integrated into the campus more so than they really are kind of now um, uh, just off of the west side of the Golden Plow Lodge. So they will be uh, certainly fr uh, front and uh, foremost in, the, um, in this uh, design scheme. Um, the uh, proponents uh, did uh, give you a good overview of the consultations with the neighboring property owners, uh, as well as the, uh, the courthouse road um, impending closure. And I think the county mentioned this at the last uh, presentation to, to council in June, that the closure of um, the east and north section of courthouse road is imperative to the success uh, of the um, Golden Plow Lodge redevelopment. It, it's something that the county um, certainly uh, worked very hard to uh, acquire additional lands at the top end of uh, Courthouse Road and um, create a, a very regular um, usable space uh, for, uh, for the new plow and bring it closer to the south of, of the site. Um, so the, the landscape, site and landscape design was, uh, is very uh, elaborate and, and generous for this particular property. Um, there's over 200 uh, new trees being provided um, on site for as part of the redevelopment in addition to protection of existing trees in the vicinity of, uh, of the existing Golden Plow Lodge um, once, it, uh, once it is demolished. And together with all of the garden areas and seating areas that I mentioned, there's over 2,700 shrubs and plants to be incorporated into the design, which is, is a very uh, extensive uh, landscaping. Reference was made to numerous courtyards, uh, both internal to the building, so accessed by the internal <coughs> excuse me, staff and, and residents, as well as external courtyards um, and seating areas throughout the site. And this <coughs> excuse me, goes a long way towards their uh, LEED certification, which um, is very important to point out that it is distinguished from Passive House, and that Passive House is very much just a building-oriented, sustainable, high-performance design system whereas LEED is more of a neighborhood or a complex area-wide uh, uh, sustainability um, uh, checklist, I guess you could say, which not only looks at the um, sustainable elements of the building in terms of green roofs and high efficiency HVAC and all of that, but also looks to active transportation modes, um, protection of natural and cultural heritage, and uh, other features external to the building which qualify as check marks to the LEED certification. So I know a little bit more maybe about LEED than I did about Passive House in that, in that sense. But I'm certainly not an expert by any means. Um, as mentioned, the uh, parking for the GPL will be split with the south area being reserved for uh, visitors um, and the north area for uh, staff and uh, service and loading areas uh, for, the, for the facility. Overall, there will be parking for 203 vehicles, uh, including six barrier-free spaces. Um, talking sustainability, there will be five electric vehicle parking spaces and charging centers, 11 green vehicle parking spaces, four visitor bicycle uh, spaces, as well as covered bike shelter for employees. Uh, the presenting team did provide you with a, uh, an overview of uh, the building elevation, so I'll uh, just kind of breeze through those. Here's an example of one of those exterior secure courtyards where um, residents will be able to access and be secure from um, the outside, uh, whereas many of the other garden areas are open and, f and free uh, to, um, to, to the general um, visitor population throughout the site. So these are, are going to be safe, secure areas for residents. The um, composition of the building, as indicated, will be a combination of uh, architectural block, uh, brick veneer, as well as um, some wood feel or wood-shaped um, uh, aluminum cladding, uh, curtain window wall blocks, as mentioned, to provide ample light and, um, and uh, passive uh, solar benefit and gain to the, uh, to the buildings. 
and also uh, a number of natural um, earth elements such as uh, natural wood timber. If you've ever been into the Northumberland County headquarters, they use a lot of uh, natural wood timber within that building and it too is a LEED uh, certified uh, building as well. Um, in terms of accessible design, um, the uh, complex and surrounding uh, lands were um, reviewed with, a, with an accessibility lens. Enhanced accessibility will, measures will be incorporated including uh, fully barrier-free curbing access, uh, pathways, um, seating areas, uh, doorways, entryways into the facility, and particularly to meet the provincial requirements for long-term care homes, of course, um, but also um, government buildings are required to be um, very free and accessible. Um, the architect did, in fact, um, meet uh, personally with the Accessibility Advisory Committee back in the fall, approximately a year ago, uh, to go over the, uh, the design plans and uh, the questions of the committee were uh, uh, answered and addressed at that time. Just a review of public notification and engagement. Uh, last September, the notice of application and information memo was brought to council uh, in open session. The information was also posted on the municipal planning applications website. And two site plan application notice signs were posted on the property, uh, one abutting the Elgin Street frontage and the other abutting the Burnham Street uh, frontage. I mentioned that um, the county uh, chief administrative officer has provided uh, council with some updates along the way, the last meeting being on June the 1st of 2020. And of course, all site plan applications are dealt with in uh, open public session. Um, from a financial consideration perspective, uh, the application fee alone and deposits were $5,500. Uh, this is a $100 million facility, is certainly one of the largest uh, development projects uh, Coburg has ever had and uh, will result in over $320,000 in uh, building permit fees. With respect to the building, sorry, the tree levy, uh, over $5,100 will be uh, accounted for as part of the municipal tree levy. Those funds go into the uh, tree reserve that the arborist uses to plant uh, new trees along municipal boulevards, particularly budding uh, the subject properties. And as a government body, uh, the county is exempt from municipal development charges. And finally, uh, Madam Chair, the recommendation, as you have uh, noted and read out uh, for Council, is there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or refer any to the presenting team. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, for that summary and thorough walkthrough. Any questions from members of Council to the Director? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion on the floor as read and as presented on the agenda. I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you very much. The final item and item number three is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding the clearance of conditions for the draft plan of subdivision pre-servicing and subdivision agreement for Kingswood 425 and 425A King Street West Coburg, Mason Homes Limited. The action recommended is that Council receive the memo from the Director of Planning and Development for information purposes, and further, that Council authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and presented to Council for adoption at a regular Council meeting to authorize the Mayor and the Municipal Clerk to execute a pre-servicing agreement and a subdivision agreement with Mason Homes Limited for the 27-unit residential subdivision development located at 425 and 425A King Street East, subject to the finalization of details by municipal staff and partner review agencies. Any preliminary questions before the director proceeds with the presentation? Seeing none, over to you, Mr. McClashen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and to attach to your agenda, you will find my staff report uh, providing a summary of many of the key elements of this proposal that has been before Council in a variety of forms, um, including a draft plan of subdivision approval with conditions. And uh, currently, we are uh, dealing with the clearance of draft plan conditions for final approval of the Mason Home subdivision, known as uh, Kingswood subdivision. Um, so um, this evening, um, we have uh, some presenters who wish to provide Council with a uh, formal summary presentation, um, followed by uh, myself with a uh, similar summary presentation as well. Uh, so we have, uh, from Mason Homes, we have Karen Liu, uh, project uh, developer, de development coordinator, I believe, as well as uh, Mr. Gordon Mason uh, from Mason Homes.
Mr. Chairman, members of staff, members of council, what am I saying? That's what happens to you when you get as old and forgetful as me, guys. Anyway, I hope you don't mind that my assistant here, Karen Lewis, come up because I have a hearing disability. And um, we, I have not been involved in the negotiations with the staff here. Am I talking too loud? No. That's a problem when you don't hear well. You don't know your elevation or your volume or your voice. Anyways, you're going to just have to put up with me for a couple of minutes, so then I'm out of here. Um, I understand the, um, as we have it today in the report, we agree with all of it except one item. And um, it's not a very contentious issue. But it has come to my attention, and I just wanted to bring my experience here and my recommendation to the, to the council. And it's the fencing on the west side of the property, and it goes from the south end of the uh, car lot down to the south end of the site. <clears throat> and there's a heavy vegetation along that property line. And we have found that a chain link fence with vegetation in front of it and around it is a softer eyesight than looking at a wood fence. And also, it's a better fence. It lasts longer. And in my experience, which is a couple of years, the wood fences, uh, they get destroyed pretty quickly. And we prefer not to put them in and construct them. And our recommendation is, and I understood it was in the recommendations originally from staff, that the fencing could be chain link. And my recommendation is that we change that part of the uh, agreement to say that it's chain link fencing. And I think it would just be a better job. It will be greener, less invasive than a wood fence, and it will last longer. And Beyond that, I guess I'd like to thank staff, thank the staff and yourselves for us being here tonight. And we hope we can go forward with the development. And we hope to be in before council quickly. And we would service it this, we'll take the vegetation out, we'll service it this winter and be building houses there next spring if we can have it serviced in time and all the approvals in place. Thank you, gentlemen and ma'am. Any, quest any questions you'd like to ask me? Uh, myself, quite possibly, just pro perhaps before we proceed into the application, and then I recognize um, Councillor Chorley, you had your hand up. Uh, to your request around the chain link versus a wood fence, uh, Director McGlashan, would you like to speak to that right now in the context of your staff report or wait till after the presentation is received? Um, it's uh, at Council's wish, uh, w if you wish to wait uh, through for the presentations first, uh, it might be the best way to handle it, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll, if Councillor Chorley, if you're okay, I'll just pause and take questions at the end of the presentation. Mr. Mason, are you going to stick around for the end of the to the end of the presentation? Yes, we'll be here. Okay, thank you. Are you okay, Councillor Chorley, waiting till the end? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, you, you have in your packages uh, the paper copies of the Mason Homes uh, presentation. Um, they wanted to um, just skip right to the, uh, the nitty gritty and uh, we'll go to uh, my presentation and overview of uh, the uh, application. Um, so the, the area of land, uh, as you may know, is approximately 1.6 uh, hectares of land um, on King Street East just east of Brook Road South on the south side. Um, the lands have been vacant for many years, but were formerly occupied by an old uh, motel that was demolished uh, a number of years ago. Uh, so this is a, a picture of the draft plan. It's a fairly technical uh, document, but uh, it illustrates that there are 27 uh, freehold townhouse lots on five uh, blocks of land accessed by a municipal road extension being um, Orchard Avenue. 
um, which will connect with King Street East. Uh, there is also, as you can see along the south uh, limit of the property, included as part of the road allowance, uh, is an extra wide uh, buffer, uh, which will accommodate um, landscaping and tree protection along the north side of uh, Molly Baker Lane, which runs fully east-west across the site, uh, the south limit of the site from Orchard Avenue to Brook Road South. So originally the application for draft plan approval uh, with conditions was granted by Council uh, in October of 2019. Uh, I've indicated in my report and certainly um, has a very detailed background and analysis of this application is my September 16th, 2019 planning report to council does provide a lot of, a uh, lot more detailed um, background information and should be read in conjunction with my, uh, my staff report. So similar to the other applications, uh, part of the background review by our development team involved an extensive amount of uh, study. In fact, this one um, in particular um, involved over 15 different uh, studies, reports, and, and drawings, including um, detailed engineering, stormwater management, but also extensive tree protection, preservation, butternut assessments, landscape design, architectural design, and such, uh, as well as uh, heritage impact assessment and assessments and traffic impact briefs, very important aspects of, uh, of this review. From a policy and regulatory perspective, the lands are designated as mixed use area in the uh, Town of Coburg official plan. Um, the zoning is multiple residential exception for holding zone in the uh, current zoning bylaw. And that zoning has been in effect uh, for probably 25, 30 years since um, a previous landowner had, uh, had applied to rezone the property for townhouses um, many years ago. Um, so the, the subdivision design, as I indicated, is an extension of uh, Orchard Avenue up to King Street East. The or new Orchard Avenue extension will be constructed to uh, ur full urban municipal standards, which will include concrete curbs, gutter, municipal concrete sidewalk, u underground utilities, and a connection, uh, pedestrian connection to uh, Molly Baker Lane with a crosswalk. There is also a five meter wide uh, street allowance dedication along King Street uh, East, uh, for future boulevard and utilities uh, expansion into those areas. Um, you, can't, you can see a little bit the outline of the proposed townhouses on this um, site uh, layout drawing, but Mason Homes has applied for a minor variance which will be heard by the Committee of Adjustment regarding some uh, relief and variances to setbacks uh, related to the front and exterior side yards. And what uh, Mason uh, Homes have done with their architectural designs is include an art, arts and crafts style design with front porches and columns. And the intent is to bring those buildings closer to the street and the porches um, while maintaining enough room for uh, off street parking. And accordingly, the bylaw doesn't recognize setbacks that are below six meters for front, fronts of, of dwellings and exterior side yards. So therefore they've asked for some variances or relief to allow for the buildings to be moved closer to Orchard Avenue. And this not only satisfies our urban design objectives to bring buildings closer to the street, provide a sense of enclosure to the road, divide, define the, the street edge, but it also helps um, uh, provide eyes on the street. You would have eyes um, closer to the street, um, safety uh, for pedestrians, um, particularly uh, in the evening hours. Also, the result of moving the buildings forward maximizes the rear yard space of these townhouses to um, provide extra spatial separation between the rear of these townhouses and the abutting residential units. And in fact, the, uh, the setback for rear yards is double what the minimum standard is uh, in, in normal uh, subdivisions. Um, so in terms of landscape design, this was certainly a major element of the review from day one um, when the application was submitted. So there are uh, a large number of uh, perimeter trees throughout the site that are being protected. Um, in particular, 20 trees located within the natural uh, protection or vegetative buffer along the south limits of the subdivision uh, on the north side of Molly Baker Lane. You see with the red uh, circle there. And some, some of the trees on the site have been assessed by the arborists as being in poor health. Um, some are ash trees, which are either dying or dead and have to be removed. 
or there are other compartments with younger successional type trees, smaller caliper, and uh, would be removed, and others that are impacted by grading, servicing, or development encroachments of some kind and are, are needing to be removed. So the landscape and tree compensation uh, plan identifies the replanting of 100 trees on the property, uh, primarily around the perimeter and within the municipal boulevards, as you can see uh, on this landscape plan. There are um, some larger trees on the south limit, uh, southeast limit of the site closer to Orchard Avenue in this location where inevitably some of the trees are going to have to be removed and some of them are fairly large. Um, one, of, one or two of which are in poor condition. Uh, the proponents plan to uh, replant five 100 millimeter uh, caliper red oaks as compensation for those removals in the Molly Baker Lane Trail area and as well plant four additional uh, 70, 50 to 70 millimeter uh, red oaks uh, along the um, south limit of the new road allowance. So there is going to be a compensation element to this uh, area of, uh, of removals. And as um, Mr. Mason uh, did indicate, much of the site will be, um, uh, much of the perimeter of the site will be fenced with uh, board um, fencing. Um, there was some back and forth and discussion, as Mr. Mason has indicated, with respect to whether it should be chain link fence or whether it should be wood fence. And um, the, the town arborist and our development team struggled with the idea of what's better, you know, trying to retain the vegetation and bushes and shrubs that exist along that side um, and allowing for, some, for chain link or providing the actual physical uh, privacy buffer that a solid wood fence would achieve and but you may run the risk of um, losing some of that vegetation. So it was kind of a, it was a very difficult saw off. Um, the end result was the latest uh, review in August was uh, from our arborist said there really shouldn't be that much difference in impact to the trees for a chain link fence versus a wood fence. But both both options you need to drill holes, you need to put concrete in the ground and poles and such. So the actual logistics of putting a wood fence versus a chain link fence are not that much different according to the, the arborist, but it's just the, the impact potentially on some of the vegetation trampling removals to get in there to do the work. So that was, uh, I will agree, a very um, contentious yet not as significant in terms of the overall development um, scope of things uh, uh, was, and uh, we certainly appreciate Mr. Mason's uh, commentary to that effect. So the fence uh, in question uh, is identified on the left side of that screen in hatched um, lineage. There would be a wood fence separating the commercial car lot from the residential, and that is a natural between two um, uh, dissimilar land uses. However, uh, townhouses and singles don't typically uh, utilize wood in terms of privacy. They're, they're fairly similar in terms of uh, building type and, and design. Additional fencing would be located along the east side of the property, abutting the old Tangemere uh, Estates uh, historic residence, and also along the east section of the southeast section, abutting um, existing residential on Orchard uh, Avenue. Um, along the north uh, section of the uh, site, there will be enhanced uh, trees and shrubbery and plantings along King Street East to provide uh, extra appeal and buffering along uh, that road allowance. In addition to the replanting of trees uh, on the site, uh, the uh, proponents will be providing the town with a tree compensation payment based on a calculation uh, algorithm uh, produced by the, uh, the municipal ar arborist uh, to the tune of approximately $15,000, uh, again, to be placed in a tree uh, reserve for future tree planting in the municipality. Sorry about that. Um, in terms of architectural design, um, I mentioned that um, the Kingswood subdivision and Mason Homes are proposing to uh, develop an arts and crafts uh, style of architectural design um, in keeping with the scale and, and uh, massing of, of the surrounding neighborhood. One and two story um, 
building typology. The intent is to create a very intimate streetscape and appearance and feel and uh, harmonize with the, um, with the existing neighborhood while also reflecting an increased density that is um, uh, usually warranted in uh, budding major arterial roads and mixed use kind of nodes. So three distinct um, uh, unit types uh, break up the facade of the building. As you can see by these uh, diagrams, there are combinations of brick masonry, uh, wood shingle, facing, different roof lines and treatments and gables and, and hips and such uh, part of the roof, roof units too physically kind of distinguished parts of the townhouses in that they don't look sort of monotonous. Also, as indicated, ample front windows would be uh, in incorporated in into the design to help with that eyes on the street mentality and keep um, the public realm safe. Just gonna skip along here into engineering design. And one of the uh, larger technical engineering components of, uh, of this site was stormwater management and drainage. Um, currently, or as proposed, the subdivision utilizes a combination of conventional piped infrastructure as well as green low-impact infrastructure for stormwater management purposes. The one being underground stormwater management uh, chambers within the road allowance, shown here in the red arrows, as well as uh, rear infiltration galleries uh, to the back of the western townhouse units. And this is to accommodate uh, flows from the uh, rear of these townhouse blocks and uh, infiltrate into the ground for smaller rain events, up to 25 millimeter rain events. <clears throat> uh, larger rain events over 25 millimeters would be captured through the intercepting swale and would run south and southwesterly towards Brook Road South. The, uh, the current, um, current drainage scheme of the uh, site is naturally it runs uh, to the, from King Street to the southwest towards Brook Road, south. Um, at this present time, uh, the drainage is impeded by a blocked drainage situation via Molly Baker Lane and a lot of vegetation and, and growth that has accumulated over decades um, of natural succession. So there is a, an actual drainage issue uh, currently associated with the site. So with the, uh, with the engineering design, as you can see by this uh, diagram, uh, about 90, 80 to 90 percent of the site is actually going to be captured via the internal stormwater, underground stormwater system and drained eastward through underground pipes and the stormwater chambers to the Coverdale trunk storm ma sewer main. And as you can see, the arrows depict where that uh, drainage is to go. Um, a very small component, about 10, 15 percent of the site, which is the rear of the townhouse units, would flow to the west but this will be accommodated through the infiltration gallery for smaller rain events, 25 millimeters or less, and um, be captured by the intercepting swale uh, towards the southwest for larger rain events. So the location of that um, swale is going to be improved by uh, Mason Homes as part of this uh, servicing of this development. So towards Molly Baker Lane in the southwest corner of the site, just to the sort of east and south of 38 um, Brook Road South, north of Molly Baker Lane, there will be a culvert placed underneath the existing lane and a swale will be hand dug uh, with supervision of consulting engineers and the arborists to ensure that the swale meanders through that wooded area without negatively impacting existing trees and vegetation and provide an outlet uh, to Brook Road South as you can see by those uh, smaller red arrows on that uh, plan. In summary, the development will actually reduce the amount of flow that will be running towards Bro Brook Road South. Um, in terms of sustainable design, <clears throat> the proponents um, have uh, identified there a certified Energy Star certified builder since uh, 2005, which exceeds Ontario Building Code standards. <clears throat> Excuse me, they are placing a high, uh, high emphasis on high quality building materials, compact built form, resource preservation in terms of cultural and natural heritage resource conservation and stewardship. They are also using uh, green infrastructure techniques wherever possible with the underground infiltration storage chambers as well as the infiltration galleries to the rear of some of the units. 
Um, from an accessible and visible uh, design perspective, the public realm uh, infrastructure will be uh, fully accessible, including the uh, municipal concrete sidewalk system with tactile plates, as well as a pedestrian crosswalk will be uh, installed at the east end of the development, um, abutting the existing Orchard Avenue, to connect with Molly Baker Lane. And there would be a dedicated crosswalk and crossing into the laneway. <clears throat> In addition, uh, Mason Homes strives to ensure that the, uh, the entries and opening elevations of their buildings are as close to grade and as street level as possible. And this is to minimize the number of steps and make it more accessible and visitable to um, residents and visitors alike and to those with, uh, with disabilities. In terms of public notification and engagement, uh, the initial application was uh, received by council uh, earlier this year, just before the, the pandemic uh, began. Um, applicant voluntarily convened a public information uh, meeting and uh, as, sorry this is in 2019 a publicly a public information meeting Victoria Hall uh, in uh, April of 2019 and the public meeting of council was held in the fall of 2019 council granted the approval of the uh, draft plan with conditions uh, subsequently in October so in January of this year Mason Holmes submitted their application to clear uh, conditions Staff information report and notice went to council on February 18th, and persons uh, on record were provided with uh, notification of the application and where to provide or where to obtain information on the website of these uh, uh, of this application. Financial considerations include the uh, $7,850 uh, subdivision clearance fee and deposit. Um, in terms of development charges, based on the 2020 rates, the development of 27 townhouses of this size would generate approximately $360,000 uh, in development charges for the municipality. Uh, there is a cash in lieu of parkland payment of approximately $50,000 uh, for uh, the town's parks reserve account. And in addition, as mentioned previously, the tree compensation levy of just over $15,000 uh, uh, to uh, go towards the tree reserve. And in terms of building permit fees for the units, it'd be approximately fifty-five to sixty thousand uh, dollars in uh, building permit revenues. And Madam Chair, uh, that concludes uh, my summary presentation. And you have already uh, read out the recommendation, and, and I'd be happy to answer any uh, any questions that council may have. Thank you, Mr. McGlashan. Any questions from members of council? Starting with Councillor Charlie, I believe had a question for Mr. Mason, followed by Councillor Darling. Um, thank you. My question regarding the fencing, I just wanted to know if there was a significant difference between the cost of a chain link fence and a wooden fence. Sorry, do you mind repeating that for our board? Sure. My question was, is there a significant difference in cost between the chain link, link fence and the wooden fence that, you're, that you've suggested? Significant. Um, I don't think it is. It's, it's a bit. It's... Uh, I don't know, it's about 30% more for the wood. The lumber's gone up, maybe it'd be 40, I don't know. But it's not going to make or break the project, I can assure you that. I brought it to your attention because I think the chain link is better. That's the only reason. And through you, Madam Chair, um, in terms of cost, I, I'm, fortunately I don't have a differentiation of, of the cost, but Mr. Uh, Mason certainly would, but um, yeah, as I indicated uh, earlier that the, the fencing issue was one of those difficult ones actually as part of this uh, review. The others seem to be very technically sound and um, methodical and, and completed through the process quite well. The only issue is that a number of residents on Brook Road South did reach out to the, the planning department, uh, which back onto those townhouses and did prefer to see a wood fence along that um, back area. Not all of them. We did. We only received a couple of inquiries from, from the public. So it's 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 one of those issues uh, that uh, you know council and staff 
alike are, are struggling with uh, for this particular development, and I'm not sure of the, the resolution, um, to be frank. And to the director, would you be looking for a resolution from council, or do you think that that's something that you could satisfy through the finalization of details by municipal staff and partner review agencies? And that's a very good uh, question, um, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and as part of that, we may <clears throat> work with uh, Mason Homes to see if we can uh, consult with those individual uh, neighbors a little bit closely and see what, you know, maybe even some field investigations and review such individual backyards. To, I, I think it's something that um, we potentially could come to a resolution as part of details of staff, but um, failing which, we, um, we may have to come back to council to, uh, for that, um, to adjudicate that, I guess, that issue. Thank you, and I have to apologize to Councillor Darling. I inserted a question before going to you, and then I see that the mayor has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McGlash, I have a, some concerns as, concerns as a coordinator of uh, public works. I see in the engineering design here the uh, infiltration gallery. Notice there's a couple inspection ports on the plans. Uh, will there be a pretreatment device of any sort um, to collect sediment before the water goes into the infiltration gallery, or do the catch basins go directly in? Through you, Madam Chair, are you you're looking at the infiltration galleries or the underground storage uh, uh, stormwater chambers? Yeah, in the stormwater chambers. In the chambers, okay, because the infiltration gallery shouldn't have any ports to them. But uh, maybe I'll direct that uh, question to uh, Director Wills. As, uh, she certainly has more expertise in answering that for Councillor Darling. Thank you. Hi there. <laughs> Through the chair. Uh, so I would have to... Uh, take a more detailed look at the uh, at the plans, but as far as underground storage goes, there's typically an oil grid separator before um, for all the inlet water that comes into an underground storage unit before it's allowed to infiltrate into the ground. So if there was drainage coming directly from the road from a catch basin, then they would go to an um, oil grid separator first before going into the underground storage. Um, follow up. Now the um the existing exert, uh, Orchard Avenue block going over to Coverdale does not have storm sewer. I take there's going to be a, a pipe dug up and go into uh, along Orchard Avenue, the existing block over to Coverdale. At that time, will Coverdale, pardon me, will the existing block of Orchard Avenue be brought, brought up to urban municipal standards or will it just be the um, storm sewer outlet pipe that'll go over to Coverdale? Through you, uh, Madam Chair to Councillor Darling, my understanding is that uh, the obligation of Mason Homes is to construct the underground uh, stormwater pipe. Um, any further urbanization of Orchard Avenue from the uh, existing termination over to Coverdale would be the responsibility of the municipality to, uh, to accommodate over and above um, what uh, Mason Homes would be doing. Okay, thank you very much. Your Worship. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't have a question at this time, but uh, I had a very similar situation. Uh, I have a 300-foot backyard, and I was trying to determine, do I put in a wood fence or a chain fence? And uh, because the length of the property, I cover five homes on a particular street. In this case, I can see you cover six. And uh, when I priced it out, I can tell you uh, I was four times the cost of a chain link fence. But personally, I don't like chain link, so I came to a compromise. And what I did, I hired someone who did strip fencing for me in a grid pattern. And it accomplished two things. It gave me the look of a chain link fence where vegetation could go through and around, and yet I had the luxury of wood at half the cost. So um, if you'd ever like to see it, I'm happy to give you my address. I get many compliments on the fence because it's so unique and different, and it's satisfied. I went down my neighbors, because I have neighbors, I wanted to make them happy, and all of them were delighted because they could see through, 
And for a few of my neighbors, they have small dogs, and they like the fact they can go through the holes in the fence to visit my dog, go figure. But um, it might be a possible solution because it's a compromise between the two, and it saved me, personally, a lot of money. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Yep, certainly, Madam Chair, we can uh, look at the, uh, the options with uh, Mr. Mason and possibly take the mayor up on his offer to have a look at his, his fencing to see what that's like. Thank you. Any other questions to your worship? Yes, I have more of a technical question for either one of you. I know to all those living in this community, Mahler, Molly Baker Lane is uh, very important for so many reasons. It's been part of our culture for a number of years. I know we are losing trees for different reasons. I, I guess, Mr. McGlashan, I know we're compensating for trees and the money and the trees and the red oaks, and that's fantastic. But when it comes to the actual lane itself, my understanding, the lane maintenance belongs to the town of Coburg. So my question is, would this be the appropriate time, if we can, to use some of that $15,000 towards improving the actual lane because it's been some time since it's had some degree of maintenance. So I guess my question would be more for you or maybe Director Huswick or Public Works. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, to the, uh, to the Mayor. It's an interesting question in terms of um, the use of the, the, tree, the tree levy. It may be something more that the cash in lieu of parkland uh, provisions would be more suited to. to um, since the cash in lieu of parkland is uh, dedicated to a parks reserve account for improvements to park spaces and trails and such throughout the municipality. Uh, the tree compensation levy is actually specifically uh, geared to the, um, the tree planting reserve account. So that's the compensation is so that the town would replant uh, trees uh, elsewhere in the municipality to achieve the canopy the, uh, that the urban forestry master plan uh, envisions. So, but I, I think uh, as part of the uh, development's cash in lieu of parkland payment, so that certainly could, uh, assuming Mr. Hustwick um, and, and parks are uh, able to do that, that would be certainly something uh, that could be looked at. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Councillor Chorley. Just following on from Mayor Henderson's question, I did hear from members of the public when this uh, subdivision was first proposed and there were, there were many concerns about how the construction would impact the tree roots of those magnificent trees along Molly Baker Lane. Could you just briefly explain how this design will address those concerns? So you, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to Councillor Chorley, that's an excellent question. And, and uh, it was a major uh, part of the initial review, um, both by the, the municipality and uh, adjacent residents. And uh, as part of the initial draft plan approval, the, uh, the area to the south um, of the site abutting Molly Baker Lane was actually redesigned such that, <clears throat> excuse me, the underground storage, stormwater storage chambers were moved um, away from the Molly Baker Lane area in that uh, southern tier, I guess, of the site and in fact incorporated underneath the road allowance, which presented some technical challenges unto itself because you've got other services like sanitary sewers and water and other things within the boulevards to, to deal with. But that's what storm, underground stormwater chambers are, are designed to do, is to deal with stormwater in tight spaces. And uh, in this particular case, there are two underground storage chambers, uh, one in the north-south arm of the Orchard Avenue extension and one in the east-west arm. So, uh, it's a train of underground storage chambers to actually help the, um, uh, create the buffer from Molly Baker Lane, which was in the neighborhood of six to eight meters, variable along the uh, south side of the site, in order to protect about 20 trees that are either on Molly Baker Lane north property limit or just north of Molly Baker Lane into the Mason Home site, which will eventually be the town's um, expanded Molly Baker Lane uh, public land. So definitely as part of the, the review process, uh, it, was, it was deemed to be a, a critical uh, element of, uh, of the program. 
and it resulted in some changes in the engineering design to, to help facilitate the minimization of disturbance of root zones along Molly Baker Lane, minimize uh, anything south of that road allowance. It'll actually, you'll see the south side of the new um, Orchard Avenue basically drop off and the buffer area protected and allowed to um, uh, regenerate and, and uh, continue on in its, uh, in its current state. So definitely uh, I, I would say that uh, was, was key. As part of construction, in terms of implementation, the municipal arborist generally requires that all tree protection zones be installed with fencing in advance of disturbance of the site and, and grading, such that the area along the south by Molly Baker Lane would be fully hoarded and protected to, to do that, protect the roots and the, uh, and the trees, and along other areas where trees are being protected. So. That's typically um, how the implementation works. The arborist needs to sign off that it's been installed correctly and then the work can occur um, on clearing the site and grading areas outside of those tree protection zones. So um, does that help uh, answer your question, Councillor Shirley? It does, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you to both. Any final questions or comments before going back to the motion on the floor? Does any member of council want to direct the uh, concerns or preferences around the fences or leave that up to staff with their final review? Uh, going back to the motion then, as read and presented on the agenda, calling a vote for those in favor of the motion. Any opposed? Seeing none, carried. Thank you very much to Mr. Mason for being here. Next, Your Worship, we have Public Works Services and we have Chair Councillor Brian Darling. And thank you, Mr. Larmer. At this time, I have a memo from the Director of Public Works regarding a process for implementing poppies on street name blades in the town of Coburg. Um, I'm going to change the action a little bit. The action recommended that Council receive the report from the Director of Public Works for information purposes and council requests staff to proceed with the process for implementing poppies on the eight full person street names listed in the staff report. I'll take any questions or comments on this situation. Councillor Chorley. Uh, thank you, Councillor Darling. I appreciate the amendment. I think it's important that we um, do move forward with this because it would be a great enhancement to see those poppies on those commemorative signs, and I want to thank Director Wills for bringing us this information so quickly. Um, I did have one further suggestion, and that was that we also enshrine this into the municipal naming policy as a standard practice. I'm just wondering, perhaps if the clerk, Mr. Larmer, can you just comment on whether that's, is that a possibility that we could make a simple amendment to that policy as well, to make sure that it's a practice that continues every time we commemorate a veteran? Through you, Mr. Chair, to members of council, certainly if that's um, added to the motion as an amendment to that policy, we can add that, that specific uh, policy and I can bring forward that draft included in the policy at next regular council meeting for you, if that's council's direction. Um, thank you, Mr. Larmer. Um, would you like to make that amendment, Council Shorty, to the motion? Action recommended? Yes, yeah, certainly I can make that amendment. It would be a simple addition and further that this be added um, to the town of Coburg's municipal naming policy as standard practice. Okay. Um, Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Chair. Um, love the amendment. I just, from my own um, heritage lens, would that, would that have to go through the Heritage Advisory Committee at all with respect to, or is that only specific to street namings in heritage zones, just out of heritage curiosity? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, to members of council, and the director can um, comment further if they needs to, but I don't believe that this would have to go to the Heritage D Department. I know that there is municipal naming provisions in heritage districts as part of the policy, which would be specific to heritage guidelines um, but I would not I would I would not say it's 
has to be part of the policy because the other pieces of policy and standards would come into place if we were crossing to a heritage district. Thank you, Mr. Larmer. Um, any further comment? Okay, I'll call the vote. Oh, sorry, um, Director Wills. Thank you, if, if I may. I uh, just wanted to make one quick point about, I'm happy to move forward with the process of um, having the poppies implemented on our existing uh, street sign as well as future. Um, I just wanted to point out that we are required to have authenticated background information and having not been involved in this process before, I'm unsure what the Legion's requirements are as far as authenticated background information. So. Um, as long as we have that information or we have access to that information um, for all the street signs that we ha currently have, we'll definitely proceed with that. And as far as moving forward, we need to make sure that we have that, that information in place because it does have to be um, approved by the Legion, not just by the municipality. So just wanted to make sure everybody's aware that that's, that process still has to happen, but we will work towards getting that information and uh, figuring out what it is that we need for every single application moving forward. Thank you for that update, Director Wills. Uh, do we have any further comment? Okay, I'll call the vote on the amendment. All in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Okay, does anybody require the full reading or are we all straightforward? Okay. So the, the action recommended, or am I here, that council receive the report for from the Director of Public Work for information purposes and Council request staff to proceed with the process for implementing poppies on eight full person street names listed in the staff report. Councilor Charlie, if you will. And further that this be added to the Town of Coburg's municipal naming policy as standard practice. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Next year, worship, we have Arts, Culture, and Tourism Services, and we have Chair Councillor Adam Biro. I notice a motion by myself regarding a graffiti art installation in the Town of Coburg. Action recommended, whereas the Town of Coburg has increasingly has seen a spike in illegal graffiti all over Coburg on our walls, mailboxes, and numerous other places, and whereas Having a place where graffiti artists have a place to express their artwork may curb the high cost of Coburg taxpayers and staff time to have clean and repaint services all over town. And whereas having a graffiti wall installed in the town of Coburg not only will help curb illegal graffiti, but also show how talented these artists are. And now therefore be resolved that council direct staff to bring back to the 2021 budget deliberations a report for costing and possible locations in the town of Coburg. So we'll open up to any discussions. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bureau. Um, I am, um, this has just come to us, obviously tonight, for the first time for discussion, and I have been in conversations with uh, our Chief of <coughs> Police and our Director of Recreation and Culture. My concern is what we're seeing around town is a far cry from art. Um, tagging is not art. I've seen some installations in larger cities, although New York City doesn't have one. Um, they have a lot of graffiti and they have a lot of people trying to eradicate the graffiti. We have been talking about a graffiti um, um, policy and bylaw, um, obviously because of everything on the general government's plate, we haven't come to uh, council with anything, but it primarily would be for the removal of graffiti. I just would like to refer this um, to um, the spring so that we can take a really good look at where we are with the budget and where we are. Um, I, I hesitate to add anything, whether it's, I know you're just asking for a uh, costing, but it sets a trend as to what we want to refer. This to me would never be a top priority because until we see art as opposed to tagging, which recently has been arrested, eight counts of, of uh, charges, um, I see that we, we probably could, well, my, my motion is to refer until after the budget and after we get the um, graffiti policy in place, which of course would come to council. So I'm envisioning spring 2021 to bring this back 
and I know that probably won't give us money in the budget, but we may find that there's no money in the budget anyway. And even if there were, I think professional artists that live in this town um, should be included and we shouldn't really um, gravitate to graffiti artists and it may or may not solve the problem. Thank you for that. And you are correct in, in one ways of um, there may not be enough money in this budget for uh, this year seeing as how COVID hit and there's a lot of extra costs that we or a lot of revenue that we have lost. Basically, this motion is just asking for a staff report to find out how much it would cost, if it's possible, in locations, and what staff thinks about it for Council. We've been wait waiting on this graffiti policy ever since before the election. Um, that was, that's, as I re recall, in the first uh, year I was chair of the downtown business improvement area, the, um, that was where it was first brought up, to my knowledge. I'm sure maybe before that but um, still nothing has been done. This is not, and I want to make myself clear, this is not for illegal graffiti that is happening out there now. This is not for that. This is, a lot of these graffiti artists, there is art. They, they have them, um, there's streets, murals, everything painted. And to me, this, calling them Yes, the ones that are just going around tagging people, but it is still a form of art. And I've learned that over the past two years being in my portfolio, arts, culture, and tourism. There, how you express yourself in art, that, that is art. However you do it, whether it's a doodle or a painting or a mural or a sculpture, that is art. And to me, all we're doing, and we may refer this in the budget or it may be voted down, I don't know. But to me, all we're asking is just for a staff report and to come back with costing and possible locations for the 2021 budget. That is it. Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Councillor Bureau. I hear what the Deputy Mayor is saying in the sense of, um, I just want to make sure in my following comments, uh, I see there's the issue that we're having with illegal tagging and graffiti in the community. But I believe the spirit of your motion is that of public art in public outdoor spaces, um, community-based art involving all legal type of art as such a program might be defined. So with that lens, um, I fully support um, your intention and principle. I remember when the city of Oshawa was developing its urban park a few years ago and thought how something like that could be implemented or replicated in our community, for example, around the Coburg State Skate Park as a way to expand upon its utility and incorporate public art into green and recreational spaces such as Donegan Park. So I reached out to Oshawa staff to get an understanding of how they developed their arts park, acknowledging that they had similar concerns around the differentiation of promoting illegal graffiti and promoting accessible public art in public spaces. And what I learned from uh, in speaking with staff as part of their feasibility review, inclu it included engaging a group of stakeholders, including artists, community-based organizations, so social outreach workers, mental health counselors, youth and staff to help with the decision making and make recommendations to the council of the day. In addition to location, the group examined partnerships, external funding opportunities, and what bylaws would have to be updated, if any. A result of that feasibility, community consultation, and approval by its Oshawa Council, they now have the Donovan um, Urban Art Park. So in learning that, I have a slight amendment to make uh, to add some of that level of detail uh, in the report that I believe would be beneficial to assist Council in its deliberation come budget time, should that's where the report land. And it, my amendment is just um, an extension of your final paragraph in the now therefore it be resolved that council directs staff to bring back to the 2021 budget deliberation a report for costing and possible locations. So I'd just like to expand on that with um, an amendment. And that would to, to add and options for partnership development with arts-based organizations the availability of any potential grants and arts-based funding that may be available to alleviate any pressure on the town's budget, as well as any bylaw changes that may need to be considered by council. 
no doubt that the director would include this in the report should that come forward, um, but I just thought by adding that level of detail into the report would not only set the expectations of council to find perhaps some of those clarifications or parameters around the intention of uh, such a public art space, but as well as communicate to the community what we would be um, informing ourselves to have uh, that conversation at budget deliberation. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Is anybody else? Oh, Councillor Burkett. Oh, uh, point of order. Yeah. Uh, point of order. I have an amendment on the floor, and now we have another amendment oh, on the floor. Oh, you did make an amendment. My apologies. My apologies on, on that. So do we vote? Do we discuss her amendment? Uh, sorry, Councillor Beatty's amendment? So, uh, through you, Chair, um, the Deputy Mayor, if, if I'm correct, she put a motion to refer on the on the, the the floor, which would be to stall any conversation on the actual right. motion, um, okay. and that needs to be voted on prior to moving forward on Councillor Beatty's amendment that she's placed on the floor. Okay, I will call a vote on the motion to refer. No, that's Can we still discuss this no, not until the motion to refer is is done. So, um, Councillor Burkett, I thought we can't discuss it if it's a motion to refer is already on the table. The point of order was that where there's no any discussion until we vote on the refer motion. So I'm calling the, the vote. All in favor to refer this motion to the spring of 2021? Those opposed? So it's denied. Any discussion on Councillor Beatty's amendment? Oh, did you have one, Councillor Burkett, first? And then I'll go to Councillor Darling and Shep. It was actually in regards to, uh, it was through you to the director possibly, given all the um, things such as the East Pier and various other things that were working projects wise, I was just wondering if they were able gonna be able to bring this back to council in a, a timely manner or is this going to push off other projects and give uh, further timelines on other things all right director heswick <laughs> uh, if it's council's will for us to bring back a report um, in a reasonable period of time we'll make it a priority thank you councillor darling um, thank you. Um, I had two questions or comments. One was to ask the director that same question. The second, um, I am in support of art. Um, when I was with Parks and Recreation as coordinator, we had discussed this. Um, director Husk and I discussed this before it kind of fell through the cracks. Um, so I am in support of all types of art. I do, I do not call uh, tagging and graffiti art. Um, I have a make it. It's a bit difficult in the fact that I feel like we're rewarding bad behavior by giving them a graffiti wall. Like I don't believe in rewarding bad behavior, but I realize that uh, everybody out there is not bad, that it's just some bad apples uh, spoil it for everybody. So um, I'm, I'm willing to have the director take a look at this and see, give, give back a staff report, see about costing. But um, I would like to ask that we give them substantial time to do that as there is a lot on the floor. Thank you. Your Worship. Um, thank you. I appreciate uh, your action recommended, and I also appreciate uh, Councillor Beatty's amendment. It reminds me very much what this town of Collingwood did. Uh, when you put these two pieces together, they have, I consider, one of the best uh, artists, uh, graffiti extension of all art on an annual, regular basis. And it's part of their culture now. I can see perhaps we might get there, but we can't get there without a report. So I will support it on that basis because I need to learn more of the logistics and how this fits in. And I think between both your parts, it uh, fits beautifully. And at the same time, I also support the deputy mayor because there's no doubt on the other side, perhaps for general government, um, we need to focus on developing a separate graffiti policy uh, for the town of Coburg, which is critically important as well. So um, I appreciate the, the deputy mayor's point on that point as well. So thank you. 
Any other discussion on the amendment? All right, I'll take a vote on, the, on Councillor Beattie's amendment. All in favor? Those opposed? Carried. Now I will read the motion. The amended motion. All right, action recommended. Whereas the town of Coburg has increasingly have a, seen a spike in illegal graffiti all over Coburg on our walls, mailboxes, and numerous other places, and whereas having a place where graffiti artists have a place to express their artwork may curb the high cost of Coburg taxpayers and staff time to have clean and repaint services all over town. And whereas having a graffiti wall installed in the town of Coburg not only will help curb illegal graffiti, but will also show how talented these artists are. And now therefore be resolved that council direct staff to bring back to the 2021 budget deliberations a report for costing, possible locations, and options for partnership development with art, arts-based organizations, the availability of any potential grants, arts-based funding that may alleviate any pressure on the town's budget, as well as any bylaw changes that may need to be considered by council. All in favor? Those opposed? Carried. Next, we have correspondence from the Secretary of the Downtown Business Improvement Area Board of Management regarding a recommendation to extend the municipally approved DBIA area patios currently permitted in the Town of Coburg Municipal Right of Way. Action recommended that Council receive the recommendation from the Coburg Downtown Business Improvement Area Board of Management for information purposes and endorse, uh, and endorse the recommendation to extend the patio deadline date for removal of patios to November 30th, 2020. I did, um, I did have another motion written, but I was corrected today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Larmer. That uh, the, I wanted this to happen to all of Coburg, but the only t patios that are on municipal, Coburg municipal land is in the downtown. So um, I did not read that other motion and I do support this. Is there any discussion on this? Your Worship? I appreciate your comment you just made, but could you clarify, because you indicated you have another motion, so is this motion standing or you put in another motion? No, this us? motion is standing. This is what I've read is standing. Okay, with the sure. clarification that it's per only the right. Muse poll. Thank you. Right. Just in case, because I was confused at that too with the other extensions, but they're all on private property and don't pertain to the municipality. Councillor Chorley? Just a quick question. Exactly how long is this, this extension? What would be the, the normal termination date? I believe the normal ter termination date is October 15th. So it's another month, month and 15 days. Your Worship? Uh, to you, Chair, and I've been corrected by Mr. Larmer, but I believe from the provincial side, when it's outside our box, uh, I believe theirs goes to uh, almost January. So yeah. this is still short of the provincial extension. Correct. Um, we don't. Uh, Councillor Beattie? No, go ahead. I just had a question of curiosity um, because the DBIA has been so generous in supporting uh, restaurants and cafes with some of the costs with regarding to patio extensions and such. Obviously, the weather will be turning in the couple next couple of weeks, so I just think as a patron, lighting, heat lamps, some of that seasonal infrastructure. Uh, is that something that the DBIA will be able to help resource with costs or have businesses talked about that? I'm just curious as a, as yeah. a patron of downtown eateries. If you know, a lot of the, um, there's three restaurants I know downtown that have the heaters already and uh, that hasn't been brought up to the board, but we can definitely take it back and let them know for sure. Any other questions? Councillor Starling? Um, yes, just uh, having had people discuss the Farmer's Almanac, we're talking snow earlier. Um, 
I could have assumed that they will shut down and clean things up if we get into a snow removal issues. Yes, for sure. Well, they, well they, um, the storefronts are required to shovel the sidewalks uh, to each of their stores or restaurants. So they would be, uh, if it was impeding any snow or anything, they would have to clear it for sure. All right, seeing no other questions, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Those opposed? Passed. Mr. Larmer, to unfinished business. Uh, yes, Your Worship, the unfinished business is listed on the agenda with the amendments that were passed at the last regular council meeting. Um, and then we have committee open forum. And if I just check my emails, the deadline was at six, Your Worship, and we received no um, submissions to um, committee open forum. Uh, based on that, uh, before we bring closure uh, to tonight's uh, session, I'd very much on behalf of uh, Coburg uh, Council would like to thank legislative services, corporate services, maintenance services. Uh, this has been a wonderful transition to move from our original council chambers into our beautiful concert hall. I believe staff worked exceptionally over this past weekend and dedicated efforts to set this room up and to meet all public health regulations. I've heard nothing but compliments from members of council upon entry, and uh, I'd very much like to thank you for making tonight possible. I'd also like to thank council for their willingness to put in budget new microphones. They're making a world of difference. I can, I can hear it myself, and uh, I look forward to uh, more sessions in this regard. And I also like to thank the public for bearing with us in this first night of transition. With that, are there any other comments, questions from members of council? Seeing none, I'll call for adjournment. Councillor Darling, all in favor? Carried.